Right. So the point of this talk uh, is to sort of talk about privacy and cryptocurrency. It's not to shill Zcash. I am one of the co-founders of Zcash, um, but more importantly, I'm also an academic. I do research on uh, cryptography, privacy, and uh, computer security. I've been doing this for uh, five, six years now. And I've watched blockchain sort of evolve from Bitcoin into Ethereum into everything else as more and more people have gotten interested in them. And we still haven't done a good job about talking about privacy. And this is important because the people who are working in this area, who are trying to get blockchains to succeed for payments, the hope is that they're going to, you know, take over the world. They're going to supplant Visa or whatever the, you know, whatever the latest thing in your pitch deck is. And if that works out, we're going to have a big problem if the stuff isn't private. But if it works out, by the time this happens, it will be too late to actually fix it. So we need to understand what the privacy implications of these things are now beforehand, before we get to that point. Um, that worked a moment ago. Just give the talk from here for a moment. Um, right, so this stuff is gonna be important and if we don't get it right now, we're gonna find out too late, fix it. And, you know, privacy for cryptocurrencies has been a thing that's been misunderstood sort of since the beginning. Um, ah. That was what was wrong. Uh, it wasn't the clicker. The window lost focus. <sighs> yeah. Right. So now, okay. Right. So privacy for cryptocurrencies has been misunderstood since sort of the beginning, right? Uh, Bitcoin thought it was private. Right. There's actually a whole section in the paper where Satoshi says this actually has some degree of privacy. Um, back in 2011, WikiLeaks thought they were taking uh, anonymous payments, right? You could donate money to them and it'll be fine. Uh, this is not the case. It's kind of obviously not the case, but we now know this with some degree of uh, authority. Not just are there a bunch of academic papers that point out, look, this is not private. We can get a lot of data out of here. There are actually companies that are in the business of doing blockchain analytics. Right? And apparently the story is, in fact, that one of these was formed because they saw a paper in the middle there at a conference and were like, hmm, that's a good idea. We should make a business out of it. So really, really, this is not true. This stuff is not private. And the reality of the matter is, far from being private, cryptocurrency is actually Twitter for your bank account. Right? It makes all of your spending public to everybody. And when I say everybody, I really do mean everybody. It's blockchains a decentralized system, they're a peer-to-peer -peer network, anybody can connect and download the entire blockchain. This means your creepy ex-boyfriend or girlfriend can figure out what you're doing, uh, your business competitors can figure out who your employees are, how much you're paying them, what your supply chains are. Um, governments can figure out what other governments are doing in terms of monetary policy. You imagine this world in which blockchains are used for all payments, this gets really bad. And so this is clearly, I think, just unacceptable. And as a result of this, we've seen a bunch of proposals that try to do some kind of privacy for blockchain. And these run the range from things that are so simple that they clearly don't work all the way up to things that are horrendously complicated. Um, my uh, doctoral dissertation uh, is on there, it's zero cash. That took like three or four years to figure out how to do. Um, and I think works pretty well. But there's this whole range of things. And if you're trying to build a blockchain, you've got to figure out which one of these privacy techniques should we use. You've got to balance like the cryptographic costs of doing that, the overhead of what's going on with how much privacy it gets. 
And right now, the sort of philosophy that everyone has is, well, any privacy is good enough, and so you take the cheapest thing that's on here. And that does not actually work. Um, and the problem with this is that it's not really easy to evaluate what privacy you get out of one of these systems. Right? It's akin to evaluating security and privacy issues on the World Wide Web in 1992 when the only thing that was running was websites at CERN. Right? This is not the full scope of what life looks like. You don't have all the things you have to think about. It just, it's not there, right? You can't measure empirical attacks when you don't have the groundwork to do it. Um, moreover, even if you did have some data, even if we have companies doing this type of analysis as researchers, as academics, I can't replicate, right? I have ethics limitations, I have data access limitations, I have IRB things I have to go through, I have limited money and limited grad students. I can't replicate what's actually going to happen with these kind of problems, right? You just, you can't figure it out just by thinking it through and doing empirical measurements. So what we end up having to do is do thought experiments. This is really the only tool we have right now to look at what cryptocurrency is gonna look like in terms of privacy, not now, but 10, 20, 30 years from now, if we survive the uh, you know, cryptocurrency winter that's happening right now. And in order to do this, you have to start thinking about privacy threats outside of cryptocurrency first, because you have to understand what people are trying to do and what the problems are that, that uh, you have to solve, like what are the real threats to privacy? And the answer here is not things like the government. That is an answer, but it's not really the main one you need to worry about, right? Um, so what are real world privacy? One of the obvious ones is advertising, right? There have been a lot of headlines now for Google actually collecting real world shopping and payment data, like when you make a payment at Walmart or Target, they find out about it and they want to be able to use this to pay for uh, conversions on ads. The idea being they saw that you got an ad for Walmart on one of your searches, they know that a day later you went in and purchased something, and now they can actually, you know, pay for conversion and get paid better because the ad worked. And this is a thing that Google just started doing recently to be um, somewhat high profile, but it's been going on amongst a number of companies probably for a while. Basically, once Google gets to doing something, you probably know a couple of other people are doing it without any integrity. And so this is sort of one problem. You can imagine, like, advertisers monetizing what you're doing. You could think of, for example, a version of Uber that was easy. We know you can't actually drive and probably maybe you're too drunk to walk, so we're going to charge you a lot more money for your ride because you can, right? So these kind of things will happen, right? And this is problem one, but it's not the only thing, right? You're also going to get things that are even more insidious and reveal more information about you than just like you losing some money on a deal. Uh, payment data has a lot of information about our lives, sort of what you buy is almost who you are. Uh, one of the more Interesting examples of this actually dates back to well before blockchains, you know, like, well, not quite before, but a while ago, where Target, the uh, retailer, was using their customers' payment histories to send them targeted ads and coupons. And this is actually seems somewhat innocuous. It's what happens when you have a loyalty card. But they were really, really good at it. They could take your purchase history and figure out if you are pregnant and then send you baby coupons. And again, that doesn't seem like it's that sensitive until what prompted this article, uh, they do this to a teenage daughter who's been buying some things and they send the coupons to her house where her father finds them and realizes that his daughter is sexually active and pregnant, right? This is, again, a major problem, right? And this is the kind of thing you can get out of uh, payment data if you have really granular stuff that thankfully so far is not actually on the blockchain yet, but I'm sure someone has a pitch deck that proposes. So that's one set of things. Another thing you can do is just straight up stalk people. So I assume everyone here has heard of Venmo. I gave this talk in, in Europe about two weeks ago, and since they have actual functioning banks that can send money between people, no one knows what Venmo is. Um, but Venmo uh, has a social feed, right? It is public because, hey, you had to do a pitch deck, you had to raise some money, let's add social to everything. And you, by the way, you should really go into Venmo right now and disable this. If, seriously, do it now. Um, because by default, it's public to everybody. And a while ago, I guess, what, six months, a year, I'm not quite sure, this became like widely known. And people started getting guides on like how to stalk your ex-boyfriend or girlfriend based on what their Venmo feed was, where they were going, who they were seeing, what they were doing. Hey, I noticed you uh, split this bottle of wine with this guy last night. What were you doing? Like, this is quite bad. And like, people really did this. Like, the picture here is kind of playful and the colors are nice and the headlines are just like nice. Hey, ha ha. There's nothing funny about this. If I switch who this is and what's going on, this would be quite troubling. And it's just bad. 
And so this is another thing that can happen when payments are public and on a blockchain, they're public to everybody. Um, so cryptocurrency is, you know, it's Twitter for your bank account, but maybe more uh, precisely, it's a tracking cookie, right? It tracks everything you do. Everywhere you go, everywhere you make a payment in real life will now be broadcast on a blockchain and anybody can see it. And so this looks like tracking cookies on the web where anywhere you go online, you assume someone can figure out what's going on and see what you've been doing. And that's something we've gotten used to in terms of what uh, online browsing, we're kind of aware of it. We have some tools and regulations to deal with it. It's still horrible. It's still a thing I deal with in my research, but it gets infinitely worse when you apply it to in-person transactions, especially when people are ignorant of the consequences. And so the question is, you know, what do we do about this? What are the defenses? Well, if you take nothing else from this talk, right, you should take the fact that plausible deniability is not a plausible defense, right? We have AI, we have social credit systems, right? There's this nice like video going around uh, on Twitter from uh, some Chinese train where they were like threatening people with, I'm not quite sure what, if they litter or something. And in the kind of world where you have these kind of algorithmic analyses being applied to people, you can't just say, oh, it might not have been, right? this just doesn't work, right? Uh, machine learning is very good at getting, uh, extracting signal from noise. And it might not have been me as just noise to it. It doesn't actually matter, it doesn't care. And so you're back to this problem. Cryptocurrency exposes everything to everybody. What do you do about it? Well, to understand that, you have to understand what precisely it exposes. So there are a couple of things that like, you know, if you think of this as a tweet about your finance, finances, you know, what's actually, well, one thing is your IP address. Uh, maybe depending on how you're doing this, that turns out actually not to be that important, though people harp on it. Um, there's the payment amount. This is something that worries a lot of people in Bitcoin that somehow they're worried that people would tell they're buying a Lamborghini uh, instead of a cup of coffee. And yeah, the amount would tell you that, but again, not that important because if you uh, know who they're paying, sending it to, you already can figure that out, right? Nobody thinks you're buying a cup of coffee from Lamborghini Italia SA, right? You're buying a Lambo. So that's another thing. And then the final thing is the transaction, right? This sort of announcement of the transaction you make, where you know, you're moving money from your account to someone else's, contains your account identifier and the other person's account identifier. And so if you watch, you get the sort of feed of everything that happens, you can build what we call a transaction graph, which is just where money goes, right? And so like Alice pays Bob, uh, Bob pays Charlie, and you can just watch this and anybody can see this exact graph and what's going on. And this, it turns out, is actually the real major privacy problem for cryptocurrency, right? And it's not intuitive why this is, right? Um, it's easy enough, you know, the first thing that everyone realizes about cryptocurrencies is that they are Twitter for your bank account, that everything is public to third party observers. And it actually is easy enough to obfuscate that, to make it somewhat hard for a third party who knows nothing about you and has never interacted with you to figure out what's going on. But that's not actually what you should be worried about, right? You make payments to companies that are trying to track you. You take payments from people who might be trying to track you, right? It would be really bad if you like split a bottle of wine with your boyfriend and then break up with him. And somehow, because he sent you money, he can figure out what you're doing. So the threat isn't just third parties, right? And the other thing that happens is that people think, well, there's this transaction graph, right? It has this information in it. We'll just remove everybody's names from it, right? And this is actually why Satoshi thought that Bitcoin was private, right? They're going to have these pseudonyms. And it should be really hard to figure out, you know, what the map in between a pseudonym and a real name is. And it turns out that this is quite easy do, and even if you can't, it still is a problem, right? So back to the example of Target, right? They're trying to build a profile of you. They don't need to know exactly who you are, right? They just need to know that they're gonna see the same person making three different purchases. Even if this is a fixed thing, they don't actually know the name of this, this person, they've got a profile. And then if they ever, you ever do anything else, figure out, like send something to your house, they get your address, something, now they've linked this to your real identity and you're back into a problem, right? So what do you do about it? Well, there's sort of three classes of approaches. Um, there is Bitcoin, which basically does nothing. It publishes everything, right? There are these decoy-based transaction approaches, um, which try to obscure the transaction graph. The way this works is you pick, right? In Bitcoin, you identify exactly where your money is. You say, I am spending $5 that I got from this guy. And actually, the, when you point to that, that's how you know that uh, you didn't invent the money out of nowhere, right? And that, that works, it's how you get transparency, it's the power of blockchains, but it identifies as exactly where you got the money from, at least the transparency graph. And so in uh, the decoy-based systems, you don't do this. Instead of identifying the exact origin, you pick one of a couple. 
And this is what's used in, in uh, CoinJoin. It's what's used in CryptoNote. This is deployed in Monero. It's uh, proposed in Mimblewimble and Grin. And so that's one set of approaches. And then the final set of approaches is a thing called like zero coin and zero cash, which actually remove the transaction graph entirely. This is what I worked on. This was my uh, PhD thesis. What does this look like? Well, graphically, right, in Bitcoin, right, you've got a blockchain with some payments on it, and you want to make a purchase to a merchant. And in order to show that you actually have the money, you have to identify the transaction that gave you the money you're spending. And so this is, you just point to it. This is how you identify what's going on. This is how the transaction graph gets leaked. Right? So if Bob is buying something from a merchant, he got the money from Alice, he's going to have to point to the money, that money and identify that, yes, I got this money. This is Bitcoin. This is not any good. Right? In CoinJoin, Monero, these decoy-based approaches, what you do is you still have to identify when you're making a purchase the exact uh, origin of the funds. Right? You have to say, this is uh, the money I'm, I'm spending because we still need to check that it really exists. But you don't have to really be that specific. You pick couple of other different places the money might have come from. You say, look, maybe the money came from here, or maybe it came from here, or maybe it came from here. And now there's a little bit of privacy, right? We sort of obfuscated this graph. You can't quite tell what happened, right? You know, sort of like blurring what's going on if you think about it. And that's the approach that these things use. And effectively, this is just chaff, right? It's putting out noise. You can't quite tell which one of these things is the real payment, but it's in there. You're just hoping that no one can really see through what's going on and get the exact picture. And then the final approach, which is used in, in zero cash and Zcash, is to just get rid of the transaction graph entirely and using zero knowledge proofs, just not reveal anything about where you're paying. So these things uh, have been around for a while. We have some uh, research on how bad Bitcoin's uh, privacy is. That was the stuff I referenced at the beginning. There's been a lot of, well, fair amount of academic work on how well zero cash works, both in theory and in practice. But no one's really looked at how well uh, decoy-based approaches function, right? There's this notion of, oh, they're good enough and we should use them, but no one's looked at it, like thought about it really. So the question is, are these private, right? And the answer is not really. And the reason for this is a couple of things, right? There's some interesting structure in these payments. Um, if you're making a payment to a merchant, right, and you send some money to them, they're going to see that you made the payment, they know who you are, and the idea is that they should learn nothing else. But because you're using this decoy-based approach where like, you pick a possible set of origins for your funds, you say it came from one of three different places, each one of those came from one of three different places, and each one of those came from one of three different places. So it sort of you know, fans out as you go backwards, and there are more and more possible origins. But it's not infinite, right? There's this sort of like cone of these things. And this turns out to be important for reasons we'll get to uh, in a moment. Um, similarly, if you're making a payment to the merchant, you can do this yourself watching where the merchant takes the money you gave them. Right? You can think about this of like you have a dollar bill with a serial number on it, and you get to sort of watch as it moves from cash register to cash register to cash register after you hand it to like Chipotle or McDonald's or whatever. Right? And in Bitcoin, you get that picture perfectly. For these decoy systems, it gets a little fuzzy. You don't know whether it went from McDonald's to Chipotle or McDonald's to a CVS or whatever, but you have some oscillator went to one of three different places. Right? So this works in both directions. Right? And so this is a thing that you can exploit. What can you do with this? Well, the first point is you can track repeated customers. Right? So uh, if you're making payments to a coffee shop once a day, right, and you're using one of these anonymity systems, You'd like to think that they have no idea who you are. They can't build up a profile of uh, how much coffee you're buying. But it turns out that for one payment, problem. But if you make another payment, you make another payment. Eventually, they're going to get this like you know fan out of all possible origins for each one of these payments. And at the end of it, when they look at all of them, looks like there's nothing here, right? There's this complete noise. This is sort of the level of analysis people have done. But in all likelihood, all of the money you paid them came from the same place. Right? So they have these sort of you know, fuzzy sets of things where there's some, some ambiguity of what's going on, but if you really look and trace everything back, most of those don't make sense. And one of them comes from one particular fixed location because you like bought all of the cryptocurrency you're using off of Coinbase and reloaded it into one address. Right? So there's a common origin that sort of links these things together. And uh, these techniques don't hide it. Um, that's one thing. Another thing you can do, which would be somewhat concerning to a number of people in this audience, is you can actually identify who people are, right? So suppose you are a dissident, 
uh, say in Saudi Arabia, and you want to take donations to finance what you're doing, you put them up on a website on Tor, right? Hidden service with a web page like, here's me, here's what I do, here's an address to, to uh, donate to support the cause. Right? It should be the case if this thing is private, that the Saudi government can't figure out who you are and can't, you know, come arrest you or worse, right? Invite you into the Turkish consulate in uh, Istanbul, for example. And you would think for a privacy preserving cryptocurrency, you could do this, but it turns out for the decorate-based approaches, this doesn't work. Right? Because what you can do is if you have this address that's on the dark web that's supposed to be private, and you want to figure out who this person is, uh, you send them a couple of payments, say three of them. And then you go and find the uh, exchange where they've been depositing the money. And because this thing is private, the person who's depositing this money, this unfortunate dissident, is probably just doing it willy-nilly with you know, no considerations for what's going on because they think they're safe. Right? So the exchange has their real name and information, and they're hoping that no one can link these together. But if you get the exchange's records, right, you're gonna see someone who has uh, a bunch of people who have taken you know, one of these payments, and it's one of the decoys, right? You don't know if it was the real place they got the money from they deposited, but it's one of these possible origins. The funds might have come from, right? This is what decoy-based approaches do. They have this like, maybe the funds were from this thing, maybe they weren't, you can't really tell, but it's some finite set of like 30 or 100 transactions or something. Right? And so if you only have one payment, well, you're not going to be able to figure out who this guy is very well, because there'll be a number of people who have maybe picked that thing as a decoy, right? This would be a very high false positive rate, and thankfully things are not really bad enough where you can just go arrest all the hundred people who had this thing. But you didn't send one payment. You sent three, right? And now all three of them show up in one person's account. And it's really unlikely that anybody else got all three of those things as decoys. Right. And then, you know, all right, maybe three is not enough. All right, fine, do it five times, do it 10 times, do it 100 times. This isn't a large amount of money. You can do this with like one Satoshi, one cent. And so now you can identify who, who this is and what's going on. Right? And so this is really where these things break down. Repeated interactions with the sender or recipient are dangerous. Right? Most privacy coins break. Right? You repeatedly purchase something, if you re repeatedly uh, donate something, if you repeatedly accept donations, you are going to have problems if you're using decoy-based approaches. But it gets kind of worse, right? I said there's this taint tree, right? Where you have the possible set of decoy origins of a payment that goes backwards. You can also, as I said, look at this going forwards. If I pay a dollar to someone, I can watch where it might have gone, right? I pay it to the merchant. That merchant like may have sent it to, you know, another to McDonald's or to Chipotle or to CVS. I don't know which, but it's one of a couple of possibilities. Each one of them may have sent it to one of three people or one of five or one of 10. And it sort of fans out of like the probable places this was. And this, again, it looks like you don't learn that much. But there's an interesting problem you can do here um, where suppose I want to confirm uh, where a friend of mine is spending their money. Right? I have a particular merchant. I want to see if my friend is, is spending money there. What I do is I send uh, my friend a little bit of money, and I send that merchant a little bit of money. And then I just watch what happens. And I'm going to see the money fan out from the merchant's account to where it might have gone, to where that might have gone, all the way through. I'm going to watch the same thing happen uh, for my friends, the money I gave my friend. This, again, doesn't have to be a large amount of money. It can be a tiny amount of dust. And what might happen is I might see that those two things end up in the same place. And if this happens once, again, it's not going to tell me exactly what happened. Maybe just coincidence, someone picked the right decoy. Or maybe the money that I gave to the merchant, the money I gave to my friend, actually ended up in the same location because they both got deposited uh, from the merchant's uh, account into the bank, right? You don't quite know, right? Maybe these ended up working because they got moved out of the hot wallet into the cold wallet, right? But you have no idea. There are an infinite number of hypothetical stories I could tell you about this thing happening. Again, if I do it multiple times, all bets are off, right? You see this happening repeatedly, you're gonna know that these two sets of funds are correlated. And with high probability, you're gonna know that your friend is actually spending money at this merchant. So this, you know, you can have some fun with this. For example, you could use this to uh, confirm that your friend is, uh, spending cryptocurrency on Pornhub, which would be embarrassing, right? They're looking at porn, they're paying for porn, and in the case of Pornhub, they'd have to be doing it with Verge, which is like the, cryptocurrency, the official cryptocurrency of porn, which really would be weird. Um, so uh, decoy-based systems aren't private, right? We've seen three attacks where I can track people if they're sending me money. If I'm a, a merchant and I wanna build up profiles of my customers, I can track them even if they're using one of these decoy-based cryptocurrencies. 
uh, I can identify people who uh, put up addresses anonymously and try to receive funds while maintaining their privacy. That also breaks. And you know, more fundamentally, this no system that allows you to do this can really be called private, right? If your friends can figure out where you're spending uh, your money, the system isn't private. This just doesn't work. And right? so these things don't work, right? And the problem with this is that the cryptocurrency community has not been that receptive about this. In fact, the typical answer you get when you raise these objections, um, however you do it, is basically just these answers of, well, it's all right, we have stealth addresses, we have ring signatures, we have cut through transactions, or ZK snarks, or VPNs, or Tor, right? This whole litany of, of tools that are meant to distract you from the actual problem. And in order to really fix this, we need to start right, calling people out on their BS, right? We need to start actually thinking about how these things really function and what's going on, because privacy theater distracts from the actual question. Right? When you see one of these schemes proposed, don't ask what tools they're using, don't ask what techniques they're doing, at least originally, right? Ask if the features hide what they're actually supposed to, right? Like, okay, you're using ZK snarks to protect what? You're using cut throughs to protect what? Ask what they're doing, right? And the answer usually would be they don't actually protect what they think they do, right? Then ask the more important question, what else doesn't it hide? Right? What's getting lost in this? What's not being protected? That probably is what's gonna cause serious problems. And then finally, think about how this thing is actually going to be used, not today, not tomorrow, but maybe 10 years down the line, right? When you have this rich tapestry of day-to-day -day payments people make, are these techniques going to hold up? And the answer really is no, right? These things don't typically work, right? And so cryptocurrency is basically Twitter for your bank account, and you need to have serious protections, right? And decoy-based systems aren't that. Effectively, the privacy pitch for decoy based systems is, look, you're completely exposed on the blockchain. You're effectively standing naked in Times Square. And their proposal is, instead of fixing this, instead of like taking you out of Times Square, giving you some clothes, they hand you a banner. That's it. Like you literally, like you're going to try to hide behind a tiny thing. It doesn't work at all. And there's no reason really to be using this because we have stronger approaches that are a lot faster. I said the purpose of this talk was not to shell Zcash, but I am going to sell uh, the work that went into it because I'm an academic and I still have to promote something. Um, the stronger approaches, the things like zero cash, uh, actually are fast enough, right? They take less than two seconds. They take less than 40 megabytes of memory. You can practically deploy these things. And in fact, they are actually practically deployed, right? And we have better approaches, not just for on-chain payments. You can do uh, off-chain stuff, layer two, fast payments uh, for that uh, thing called Bolt. Um, and in fact, you can sort of do privacy preserving smart contracts. So that one has caveats on it. And these are both research projects, right? These are open source. Do whatever you want with them, there are no patents on them. There's really no excuse not to implement these kind of things in your own currency uh, at all. And so briefly, I would want to bring up a different problem, uh, which I think Amber actually is going to talk about more at the end of her talk. But cryptographic protocols aren't the only issue cryptocurrencies have privacy. Protocols, and a lot of them are broken, but it's not the only thing. Usability is a big issue, right? One of the major problems for Zcash is, in fact, usability, not cryptography. We got that part right. Um, and so in conclusion, we need to critically evaluate how privacy interacts with blockchains. We need to actually think about how these things are really being used. And we really need to do this now. Because if these things start succeeding and really get traction, it's going to be too late by the time we realize these are really a problem. The techniques we're using now are broken. So thank you. Uh, yeah, great talk, by the way. But um, I'm just curious, have you looked into um, privacy and data of, for your own research other than transaction cryptocurrency type? I have not. Okay. okay. <laughs> so uh, all the examples you gave are, are based on UTX block blockchain models. Mm -hmm. Do you see any fundamental difference in the uh, applicability of the, like, I would say, good cryptography for privacy to an account-based model like Ethereum? It gets a little trickier. In fact, to get good privacy, I think you sort of have to either transform your account model into a UTXO model in a certain sense, or you can try to do approaches that are based on like oblivious RAM, but these typically end up synchronizing the blockchain for every transaction because you can't do parallel edits. And that's sort of unacceptable at scale. So I think the answer is you, need to operate the UTXO model for privacy. But it's a good question. I don't have a perfect answer yet. 
Uh, yes, but you ended up having to like sort of build that into a UTXO style thing, right? We can show our former project a little bit, uh, the Quorum project, which is Ethereum with ZK Snarks, uh, adopts the UTXO model yep. uh, and integrates it with accounts. And you get the previous version with the with the higher memory usage, but uh, you know, ideally in the in the short term future, it would be a new version. 